So, Obama wasn't prepared to take on Congress, which to some extent I suppose I could understand. But you always have the option, you have the option in public life of just shutting up. <laughs> but you have to day in and day out keep repeating Israel has the right of self-defense. You take the case of my own city, New York. Well, New York is a Jewish city, it's Jewish money, and you pay a price on the Israel issue. We have now a reasonable mayor, and a good guy, uh, Mr. de Blasio, and he expressed some support for the Gaza attack. He happened, that's New York politics, but then he just shut up. It was over. He did the thing he had to do, as we used to say about leftists during elections, you hold your nose and you know, pick the switch, you should have done that party. But this, this relentless repetition of Israel has the right to self-defense, there really are limits. Not only did Israel have, as was predictable, wall-to-wall -wall support in U.S. political life, but surprisingly, or I shouldn't say surprisingly, depressingly, it now had quite a lot of support in the Arab Muslim world in particular. Egypt and Saudi Arabia, Egypt and Saudi Arabia, openly supported Israel in its attack on Gaza. The Arab League met only once, and it met in order to support imposing a ceasefire on Hamas. The rest of the Arab world, as everybody in the room knows, is being currently convulsed by so many horrors that the Palestine conflict is just no longer a priority. If you live in Yemen or Libya, Iraq or Syria, Egypt or Afghanistan, obviously Palestine is not the first item on your agenda. It's a, it's a development that has to be taken into account that the Palestine issue once had so much presence and power that it could actually intimidate virtually all the leaders in the Arab world. You, uh, you, you um, find yourself on the wrong side of Palestine, you get yourself in trouble in the Arab world. That's no longer the case. Palestine is no longer an issue with regional residents at the official level or at the popular level. Um, it found, strangely enough, new allies in a place you would have thought the last place on Earth, a huge reservoir of support in Latin America. Argentin Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, El Salvador, Chile, Peru, Uruguay, Venezuela, they all gave very powerful diplomatic support to the Palestinians, to their eternal credit, because they had nothing to gain from it. That was principle. That was countries, the expression of countries who had been under the iron heel of the United States for more than a century. And now, removing that heel from their throats, they felt solidarity with others. Uh, it was a really moving display. But the bottom line is, the uh, Palestinians in Gaza, they were alone and abandoned during the last attack. Those were the positive developments for Israel. There were a few surprises for Israel. The surprise which became most commonplace in media coverage, excuse me, media coverage, 
were what were called those terror tunnels. I think Professor Dershowitz wrote a book called Terror Tunnels. Well, I should say a book with his name on it. <laughs> terror Tunnels. I'd like to be precise in my language. Well, what's the story with those terror tunnels that we've heard so much about? Uh, in fact, uh, just give me one half second. <laughs> I got so carried away with that last reference. Uh, okay. Here we go. Whenever his name comes up, I get this. <laughs> 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 Beginning around two weeks ago, for reasons which most of you know, I started getting approximately 70 emails each day, <laughs> bringing me up to date on his latest travails. <laughs> Everybody saying, I guess you might be interested in this. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, and in fact, it's true that Hamas did construct a quite sophisticated, ramified system of tunnels in Gaza. Personally, I was not surprised. Why was I not surprised? Because having spent a good share of time in the Arab Muslim world, and having met many Arab Muslims in my adult life, we can all agree that 10 out of every 9, not 9 out of every 10, 10 out of every 9 Arab Muslims majors in civil engineering. <laughs> has a very high rate of unemployment and so you have thousands, if not millions, of unemployed civil engineers. So who can wonder, who can be surprised that they managed to construct, if you read the stories, and I've read as much as one can, um, with very rudimentary uh, technology. For example, in order to build a tunnel but that you can't hear the equipment with the Israeli drones overhead, they developed this kind of equipment with a bicycle so the Israelis couldn't hear it. Um, it was really a very impressive feat. And they built the a sophisticated, ramified tunnel system. And as a result, uh, Israel, this time around, suffered an unprecedented number of combatant casualties. As I mentioned, during Operation Cast Lead, there were about 10 Israeli combatant casualties, of which four were due to friendly fire Israelis, accidentally killing other Israelis. This time there were 67 uh, Israeli combatant casualties. Uh, and the Israelis were very nervous about what they had discovered. It still today continues to be a subject of disputation among the Israelis. Uh, even though there was officially a ground invasion, it did not go very far into Gaza. It was basically confined to the border area because they were afraid of what they would encounter um, with the Hama, I should make the point, the tunnels were not, um, they were not, they were impregnable to aerial assault and artillery shells. 
they can only be detonated in order to destroy them. You have to detonate them. You know, they were pretty deeply built and sturdy. So Israeli combatants were fearful of going in because Hamas fighters were popping out of the tunnels everywhere where they entered. Usually they would enter, everything was cleared away, as I said, everything destroyed to the left, the right, in front of you. But now they went in and Hamas uh, fighters were still there. Uh, so the Israelis were very upset about the tunnels. However, there's a misapprehension about what they were upset at. You're told in the media that what upset them were the tunnels that went from Gaza into Israel. That wasn't the problem. It's a completely total lie. First of all, of the 32 tunnels that Israel officially destroyed, of the 32 which it destroyed, only 12 of them went underneath the border from Gaza into Israel. That's the official figure, 12. In Israel, we're really concerned about the tunnels going from Gaza into southern Israel. There's a perfectly obvious way to solve that problem. They could do exactly what Egypt is doing right now. The Egyptian border also is uh, also abuts Gaza. And the Egyptian so-called President Sisi, he says that there are all these terrorists coming from Gaza into the Sinai and killing Israeli soldiers. So what did he do? Did he bomb <coughs> hospitals in Gaza? Did he blow up ambulances in Gaza? Did he bomb civilian shelters in Gaza? He built a moat along the Egyptian-Gazan border. Now, what he did was inhumane because he displaced tens of thousands of Egyptians, forced them to leave in order to build the moat. A moat being, you just dig a hole, fill it with water, and it floods the tunnels. Israel always had that option on its side of the border. You have to ask yourself a simple question. The people of Gaza, with all due credit to their civil engineers, they had very simple, rudimentary implements. How deeply could they have dug? Are you telling me on the Israeli side of the border they don't have earth-moving equipment that could go deeper than the tunnels and then just fill it with water? The issue is not the tunnels that were going into Israel. The issue was the tunnels that were inside Gaza, which made Israel's periodic assaults on Gaza, its murderous rampages, it made them more costly. As you know, Israel likes that expression that every once in a while we have to mow the lawn in Gaza. Mow the lawn, mean, meaning kill the people and destroy the civilian infrastructure. So, but it wants to do it cost free. Israeli soldiers are not supposed to die. That's not the way it works in this world. And so, they have to destroy the tunnels because. It makes mowing the lawn too costly for Israel, destroying the tunnels inside Gaza. So when you hear everybody saying, yes, it's true, the tunnels have to be destroyed, 
yes, it's true. We have to make sure that none of the concrete that enters Gaza, none of it is used for tunnels. That's just a given. That's not even a subject of debate. We all agree on that. What it means is, we all agree that the people of Gaza have to be absolutely defenseless every time Israel decides it's time to mow the lawn. They have no right, none whatsoever, to defend themselves. They have to lie there on the ground, prostrate, when Israel invades. Otherwise, some principle of moral, if not international law, has been violated. Before the issue of the tunnels came up, there was the issue of the Hamas rockets. The Hamas rocket attacks. Were there rockets being fired against Israel? Now some people are thinking, okay, this guy is going off the deep end. So far I can agree with maybe 4% of what he said. But is he going to question that Hamas rocket attacks? So let's see. Let's try to be rational, reasonable human beings, creatures. Let's start with a premise. When I hear the word rocket, it conjures up a fairly large projectile, at least in my imagination. You know, something that goes from the floor, at least to the ceiling, that's a rocket, in my mind. This is not a rocket, at least so far as my intuitive sense tells me, if I saw this on the podium, I would not expect the three officers in the back of the room to come rushing to get it, because Finkelstein has just put on display a rocket. <laughs> Not a rocket. A little too small to qualify as a rocket. So now let's see what happened. Israel says that 4,000 rockets were fired at Israel by Hamas and other armed groups. 4,000 rockets. 4,000 rockets were fired, but there were only seven civilian casualties. And there was only $15 million in property damage. So, you have to understand what that means. If a rocket hit this building right now, one rocket hit this building, it would be $15 million in property damage. Fifteen million dollars. So, prior fasting, there's a, at first glance, there's an incommensurability here. Four thousand rockets, seven civilian deaths, fifteen million dollars in property damage. That doesn't sound right. But of course, Israel had its explanation. It was called the miracle of Iron Dome. <laughs> their anti-missile defense system, another great work of Israeli or Jewish genius, Iron Dome. Well, can Iron Dome explain the fact that 4,000 rockets resulted in seven civilian casualties and only $15 million in property damage. Well, let's look and see whether that's a plausible explanation. 
Operation Task Led in 2008-9, Hamas was said to have fired 1,000 rockets at Israel. There were three civilian deaths, and they said back then, coincidentally, they also said $15 million in property damage. Now, there was no Iron Dome during Operation Cast Lead in 2008-9. The miracle of Iron Dome only comes later. It's first tested in 2012 during Operation Pillar of Defense. <coughs> now we're going to give a little math quiz to you. As I said, during Operation Task Lead, 1,000 rockets caused three civilian deaths, and there was no Iron Dome. If 1,000 rockets caused three civilian deaths, how many civilian deaths would result from 4,000 rockets? Twelve. A mathematician? <laughs> I can't say in the making. I'm sorry. It would have caused 12 civilian deaths. So, if during Operation Protective Edge there had been no Iron Dome, how many civilian deaths would there have been? Say. Say. Twelve. I want to give you the chances. <laughs> Your 15 minutes of fame. Twelve. In fact, there were seven civilian deaths during Operation Protective Edge. So what's the maximum number that Iron Dome could have accounted for? Five. And in fact, Iron Dome didn't even account for five civilian uh, saving stone. Theodore Postel did the research, and you know what he found? The Patriot, uh, the Patriot anti missile maybe, maybe hit one scud. Maybe hit one scud. He did the same research on Iron Dome. You can read it on your own on the web. Theodore, T H E O D O R E, Postal, D O S T O L. Uh, he did the same research. He concluded that at most, at most, Iron Dome had an effectiveness rate, an efficacy rate of 10%, probably closer to 5%. So, you do the math. I'll call on our, not the buddy, but genius, I'm not a medical genius. If 4,000 um, 4, Hamas rockets were fired in Israel, and 10% of them were hit and imploded in the air, by Iron Dome, how many rockets would have made it to Israel? 3,500. 3,600. 3,600. I've just lost all thinking. 3,600. Now here's the question. 3,600 rockets entered Israel. That's correct. 3,600. Now, an impressive civil defense system could account for the fact for why there were seven civilian casualties, only seven. But as we all know, buildings do not go into shelters. <laughs> Businesses do not go into shelters. Schools do not go into shelters. How do you account for the fact that 36 rockets hit Israel, and Israel itself says, 
there was only $15 million in property damage. There's only one possible explanation. The only possible explanation is what? They weren't rockets. They were enhanced fireworks. <laughs> That's a fact. The tragedy was both sides, both Israel and Hamas, both sides had a stake in escalating the effectiveness of the rockets. Israel could claim, as it did and does, that we were under attack by Hamas rockets, horror of horrors, and Hamas could claim that it was carrying out an effective resistance with its rockets. And both of them would, both and each of them, the very last thing they would want to say is, they were just fireworks. The conflict, the invasion, the massacre, and to a, 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 a minor extent, but there was an element of a war there, uh, wasn't quite like the first attack. Uh, it ends on uh, the actual ground invasion. It ends on August 3rd, and it's worthwhile to look at why it ended, how it ended, because it gives you a good insight into the political dynamics of the conflict and what are Israel's weak spots. So what happened? During the Israeli attack on Gaza, they attacked one UN shelter, schools which were converted to shelters, one UN school shelter, two UN school shelters, three, four, five, and the uh, comatose U.S. puppet, Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General of the U.N., didn't say anything. These are U.N. institutions. So you know the pressure begins to build up on Ban Ki-moon, you wretched, comatose puppet of the United States. When are you finally going to say something? 